2000. Craig Hodges will match up against Michael Jordan. Remember, the top four advance. Craig Hodges this year shooting 48% from three-point land. And as we look at both of these competing at the same time, there's Michael Jordan. Uh, Doug is going to be following Craig Hodges, who he coached last year Chicago. in Chicago. And Steve Jones Ball. is going to be taking, Michael uh, Jordan. keeping a close eye on Michael Jordan. 60 seconds to shoot. There are five racks, five balls on a rack. We're underway. Craig Hodges loves his corner shot. Houston, he really gets off to a good start. Uh, Jordan missed his first two, and now he's warmed up. And I think, you know, just the fact that this is new competition for us. Craig Hodges hitting three corners, including the two-point ball. Craig Hodges on a roll now, hitting four in a row. Craig, five in a row from the spot. Craig performed here earlier today for some school kids that was on fire at that time. It seems to still be on it right now. 28 seconds remaining. Well, Jordan has really struggled in his first two rounds, and he's going to have to really bury the next two in order to get into it. He has missed and missed almost every one and hasn't gotten a red, white, or blue ball down. It's 15 to 4, Craig Hodges early on. Well, Craig is filling it up right now. I mean, if he takes this kind of rhythm, he is going to be awfully tough to beat. He loves those corners again. He has five seconds to get three more shots up. He has not made one now from the left side. Well, Jordan struggled the entire rack. He only ended up with five going in, and it was a tough first time around for Michael Jordan. You see the look on his face, and remember, I tell you, experience in this competition is really a key. And Craig Hodges takes a great deal of pride in this competition. He was a finalist last year. He has 20 points. Jordan has five points. Now, Craig, Craig Hodges was sensational. That's the two spots. All right, Black Tree TV Sports. Today, I got a special treat for you. I got four-time <laughs> NBA champion. Uh, assistant Laker coach and a, and a man that's been active in the community since way before this this stuff even started. That's uh, a guy that I'm, I'm I'm honored to be with, Mr. Craig. Sure, Hodges, brother. Oh, you? brother, it's always good to be with you. Peace and blessings always. All right, so it's almost it's almost Christmas times, so, and and one of the best treats about Christmas times to me is the watching basketball at the Absolutely. crib and just you know chilling with the family and right. being, able, being able to do that. And this year we got. Lakers versus Heat. You know Absolutely. So, so I mean, there's it's a lot of stuff going on with this game. I mean, uh, first of all, Lakers coming off of uh, another championship mm -hmm. run and mm -hmm. uh, just getting back from the White House and now playing like you right. know one of the East contenders. I won't say all around <laughs> favorite because right. you know the Celtics still still in the East. But mm -hmm. how how have the Lakers been? Uh, how have the Lakers been coming off their championship run this season, and, and how are they, you know, preparing for? Well, all in all, I think so far we've done we've done pretty good, but I think we still uh, have a lot a lot of work to do in as far as uh, chemistry is concerned. Uh, we came out of the blocks pretty good, got off to eight and zero starting in. You know, we lost like three or four in a row, and I think what that did was wake us up to the idea of uh, it's a daily grind, and you can't rest on what you've done in the past and that the fact that you won two doesn't mean that you're going to win the third. But likewise, when you're talking about the Christmas Day game, uh, for me it's something that we've done, you know, as long as I can remember is that, like you say, hang around with the family, watch a good game on Sunday. And being a part of it is something special, especially when you talk about LeBron versus Kobe, the Heat versus the Lakers, and uh, supposedly, hopefully, the two finalists. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. Well. Um, the, the Lakers this year just got back Andrew Bynum, mm -hmm. you know, who who just coming off an injury, and uh, I hear there's been a trade with with Sasha Vujic. How, how do you think? I, I think if if that went, I don't know if it went through up to to this point, but uh, I think it would be good both for Sasha and the Lakers to give Sasha an opportunity to go play somewhere, get some minutes, and at the same time, right now we're struggling a little bit up front, and as far as uh, our numbers are concerned. So um, Joe Smith is a quality ball player. He's uh, from a big time program. He's, he's been around the league for a minute, so he understands professionalism. And coming to our team, I think it would only lend itself to him being able to come in and fit in and be a good component for us. How is back to back championships as a, as a coach as opposed to a player? I mean, because I know you did right. back to back as a, yeah. as a player yourself. Is it do you? Is it the same thing about being hungry as a coach or as, as a player? Oh, yeah. as, I think it's a, it's a different vibration. I think as a player, you're more involved uh, from the standpoint of knowing that you had an actual impact. As a coach, you have more of a uh, stand back from, you have a stand back position in as far as knowing that some of the stuff that you implement, you see, like as far as, especially for me being a shooting coach, I see some of the stuff I work on with guys and then when you see them make shots, then you know that you've done uh, what you're supposed to do as a coach. 
But all in all, I think it's a it's a gratifying experience to know that you're part of something that's continuing to build a legacy. And I think when uh, you can win both as a player and a coach, you've, you've, you've been blessed. So my biggest thing now is to see how I can teach the next generation of player and shooter. The team like the Lakers that has a lot of veterans coming back that's been with the, with the, uh, the, friend, the organization for, for years, right. is that... I mean, is that organization, I mean, it seems that they, they have an advantage over organizations that have all these new players every <laughs> Absolutely. year. Is it, is it, you know, going to the next year, is it, is it more just about refining and doing stuff like that? And see, that's the, that's the beautiful part. If you, you know, when I tell people all the time, systems win championships. And you look at San Francisco 49ers, you look at the Yankees, you look at the Lakers, you look at the Bulls. Championships are won by systems. And if you have players who are veteran players, they understand your system. So it's not as hard to adjust from year to year when new players come into your system as opposed to different teams on the outside looking in trying to figure out what is the chemistry to win a championship. So a lot of things that other teams have to do and as far as adjustments we don't have to make early in the season. So I think it lends itself to you getting a chemistry going early and a good rhythm going early and, and you can ride through all-star break going into the second half of the season pretty much in a position where you know you're ready to attack for the postseason. I see players, you know, even I've had the opportunity to cover practice mm -hmm. a couple mm -hmm. times with you guys, and, I, and I've seen players like Sasha Vujicic, you mm -hmm. know, um, mm -hmm. come up big last year in the playoffs. And I know that, you know, that, you know, the year before, like, they, they, people was questioning his shots he was taking <laughs> and stuff like that. And, and you see a Shannon Brown getting right. more developed. Mm -hmm. how, how, you know, rewarding is that, even, you know, even though you're, you're coaching and, right. and, and in the background, how, how rewarding is it to see players, like, Developing, uh, no question more. about it. And, and like Shannon, I've been watching Shannon since he was a sophomore in high school. So to see his development, I tell people all the time: the next three or four years, he's going to be one of the top guards in the league. And it's just a matter of him getting his minutes, him understanding what experience is about, and being able to do his his thing in a matter of knowing that I'm going to be out here to play. And the same thing with Sasha last year, as well as Trevor Ariza, who 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 had an opportunity to make some money because of what he did in the postseason. So I think it's gratifying from the from the standpoint that you sit, you see guys improve, and at the same time you can be part of a winning thing. That's the that's the biggest thing. It's all about winning. Let's, let's get a little, little bit into Lakers heat because we, we've heard a lot of, <laughs> we've heard a lot of players, you know, um, talk about you know their their playing days mm -hmm. and say you know the the move is kind of I guess I guess unique in a way is mm -hmm. like you know that we didn't see uh, Jordan go play with you know Larry Bird, but, right. but he did have you know. Yeah, you and Scotty and right, a lot of right, other right. great supporters, uh -huh. su mm -hmm. supporting uh, players with him. So it wasn't just him. Right. But do you think like that move, just it's just something that could have just happened today? Yeah, I think absolutely. Yeah, back in the day, it wasn't, it, and I think that this generation has become a little more sophisticated than we were. They they understand uh, marketing, they understand the magnitude of you only have a short period of time before your window is closed on your opportunity. So make the most of it. So. I wasn't really upset with the way in which LeBron did his thing, but I think it could have been a little bit better for the people in Cleveland to have known a little bit earlier that he wasn't coming back. And I think that would have made it, I think that would have made the road a little bit smoother for his post playing days because uh, you know, regardless to what we want to say as far as the sport is concerned, the impact that he had on Cleveland proper, I think in Akron, Ohio is something that, that's gonna be remit it's gonna be missed, sorely missed. And I think um, the the anger and resentment that they have for him right now, hopefully it'll, it'll, it'll calm itself down and time will heal that. But I think that was something that, that to me, that hurt me more than anything was the fact that the separation happened the way it did. But at the same time, the young man understood it's about getting your money when you can get your money. He went to a place where it's tax-free dollars, you know, no income tax in Florida. So I think he, he made the decision that was good for him and his family. And, and we, can't get, we can't argue with that because as athletes and entertainers, you're your own product, and you only have a period of time, and while, while the water is hot for you, go ahead and make as much as you can, for as long as you can. Right. But, you know, one, one thing about the move is a lot, of, a lot of people, as soon as it happened, just kind of gave them this unproven, this unproven team right. the ring. And, and, and I guess what I want to ask, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure, you know, all about Spokes' mm -hmm. background, mm -hmm. but I know, like, you know, the... You being with Tex Winter and mm -hmm. Phil Jackson, mm -hmm. you've seen a lot of Absolutely. NBA championships, Absolutely. you know, uh, and and some stuff has to come down to the coaching. Do you think, like, even with all this talent, that they'll be prepared for the playoffs? You, you that's know, the that's another thing when you talk about 
the legacy of Phil Jackson, uh, Pat Riley, and, and that's to me. I think Pat is coming, but that's no nothing for bullet, bulletin board fodder or anything. But I think it's just uh, just a matter of time before it happens. Even if Spolster wins the championship, I think Pat would still like to get a chance to coach that crew, and anyone would who, who's a coach because uh, you have a tremendous talent that has been uh, you know brought together. But at the same time, I think. A lot of it was on paper, and a lot of it is still to be determined. You know, they're on a nice little streak right now, but I think it's one of those things where as the season starts to get smaller, and as far as games are concerned, I think that's when I start to look, you know, I don't, I don't look at anything prior to All-Star break. <laughs> you know, we start looking after All-Star break when you're down to 20 games left. Now you start to see teams maneuvering to, to get guys where they get enough rest to be going into playoff strong. And I say that's where we have a, a little leg up on most teams is that we can make our adjustments throughout the season and rest people like now with Andrew coming back. First game back, power goes from playing 39 minutes to 29. So if you can take off 10 minutes a game for the next 20 games, you're talking about those minutes being able to be used in the playoffs, and that's, that's heavy for you. Mm -hmm. Well, as, as a player, I mean, mm -hmm. you, you play with, you know, uh, all-time greats, mm -hmm. and now now you have the opportunity to to coach all-time greats. I know, like a lot of people said that Kobe, when he came out, was uh, try to be like a, a, a mini me Jordan, or something <laughs> right? Like right. But comparing like, comparing their their work ethic and, right, and everything right. that they put in the game, mm -hmm. do you see any similarities? Oh, in absolutely, and I think that's the to me. Um, when you you know I, I worked hard in the game, but at the same time, you don't know what guys are doing when you're not around them. Mm -hmm. So the amount of work that MJ was putting in beyond what I was putting in was magnified once I saw what it was. Mm -hmm. So as far as looking at what Kobe does, man, there's nobody that works any harder than he does in the game. And I think the results are there for themselves. It's, and couple that with being in a great system, I think it's going to be hard to beat, man. You, you, you one of the purest shooters of all time. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, got, you still hold records of, uh, you know, three-time, uh, three-point three championship mm -hmm. winner that you mm -hmm. share with Larry Bird, but you got the most consecutive three points mm -hmm. and the most points in a round. I mean, you, 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 I mean, you're right up there with, I mean, nobody can kind of question, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know your shot. Like, where, where did you develop, uh -huh. you know, that shot? And, and was it always something natural? Like, or what, what work ethic did you have right. to do to, to have right. that? For me, for me, it started with a, a ball of socks and a hanger over a doorway when I was four years old. My uncle taught me how to basically pick, look at the target and start small and you move up. And the amount of shots I put up from the time I was probably fifth grade until I was at the end of my professional career, I don't think anybody shot any more than I did. Maybe Bird, you know, but I don't think, and even to this day, I usually, when I'm in the gym, I could get up anywhere between three and four hundred shots still. So right now, you're still knocking them down. Oh, come on, man! There's no reason to shoot if you're not gonna make them. We're not, we're not just shooting; we're making them. So I'm, the mindset for me has always been: um, you can always improve, and, and you never, you never take a shot for granted, even though you know it's going in. Like I tell people, I talk to Shannon about this all the time: is that even though we know the ball is going in, we still have to do those fundamentals required to get the ball to the basket. You're not going to think the ball into movement. Right. You have to make the movements that are proper. And then once you let it go, relax until you follow through and just <laughs> watch the results. And that's the, that's, for me, that was the most beautiful part of the game is to be able to get yourself in a zone where you know your ball is going in the basket every time you shot it. I got this theory. You know, this day and age, we have all, you know, all this video game and this right, new right. generation of mm -hmm, kids. Mm -hmm. do, do you think, like, the way... You know, I grew up on the course, and I put up right, right, right. Like, a tenth of the minutes that you right. played. Right? But you know what I'm saying? But do you think people like this day and age do that now? Because like, I don't see the people at the playgrounds as no. much. And, and see, that's, that's the, it's the difference in the game now is that it's, it's, commercial from, it's commercial from elementary school. So you have, some, you have fifth and sixth graders now whose who family are saying they're the best fifth and sixth graders in America. And you're saying, whoa, don't you want them to be the best twelfth grader or the best college player? that right now the commercialism and the marketing of the game is such that when you're in junior high school, you know the AAU team and travel team to play for that has the biggest notoriety and the most notoriety. So once you do that, 
as opposed to you working out with your teammates and the people that you're going to play with in high school and even working on your own fundamental weaknesses. You're working on winning games so that your exposure is more by colleges, shoe companies, and the likes. So that now most players aren't thinking about going to school to get a, a degree. So they knew that they was going to have to put in time on the court in order to get a scholarship. It's, it's one and done. Everybody has a one and done mentality. And that one and done mentality lends itself to the marketing end of things. So you have big corporations who are uh, sweetheart deals with 16, 17 year old children whose parents aren't involved enough to know what's going on, aren't sophisticated enough to know. So it's one of those things where the, the game has changed to such a degree that the players are now sophisticated to the point of what their own marketability is. And I think it's, it's sad for the game because it takes away from work ethics and work ethic. Mm -hmm. uh, you said a lot with that one. <laughs> you said a lot with that one. Uh, uh